This episode is brought to you by Studio, makers of fine earphones from Stockholm. And now for the show. Hello there, my friend. Welcome to a new episode of Talk Music Talk with Voice. I am Voice, and this is my podcast that you are listening to. If this happens to be your first time checking it out, let me tell you that Talk Music Talk is a weekly music interview podcast where I have long-form conversations with people connected to music from different genres and different backgrounds, both established and emerging music therapists, music journalists, singers, singer songwriters, and all sorts of other people. And on this new episode, I had the pleasure of speaking to debut novelist Joseph Kassara. His first book, The House of Impossible Beauties, just came out this past February, and it was inspired by the 1990 documentary Paris is Burning and its Harlem Ball scene. He took people from the film, and place them in his fictional world. Joseph grew up in central New Jersey and is residing in Iowa City, where he attended the Iowa Writers Workshop. We spoke when he was in New York for his promo tour of the book. We talked about a lot of things in this great conversation. We talked about the genesis of the novel, his writing process, his influences, the publication process. We also talked about how he has been handling criticism, some criticism of the book. He's been getting mainly rave reviews, but we talk about that in this conversation. Before we get to the conversation, two things I wanted to tell you about. A new Talk Music Talk live podcast event is happening on July 20th. I will be joining up with the 33 and a third book series. You know the books, those CD sized books filled with full length essays on authors writing about their favorite albums. This will take place at the historic Strand Books in New York City. I will be in conversation with four authors from the series George Grella, who wrote about Miles Davis's Bitches Brew. Ryan Lease, who wrote on LCD Sound System, Sound of Silver, Amanda Petrusich on Nick Drake's Pink Moon, and Christopher R. Weingarten on Public Enemies, It Takes a Nation of Millions to Hold Us Back. Again, that's July 20th at Strand Books, a Friday. Head on over to strandbooks.com, go to the calendar section, and you can purchase your $10 gift card for admission. That $10 gift card can be used towards anything in the store. It doesn't expire, and you could even use it towards one of the books of the authors who will be there. I also want to talk to you about headphones. If you are in the mood for a pair of beautifully designed and great sounding headphones, look no further than Studio Headphones. Based in Stockholm, they have a line featuring earbuds, over-the-ear models, and even wireless. I especially love the Regent pair because they go over the ears and I have shallow ear canals and can't use anything else. These pair of headphones come with a detachable cord so I can use them with Bluetooth on my phone or I can use the cord to record podcasts like I am doing now. Head on over to studio.com to get yourself a pair. And for the Talk Music Talk listener, you will get 15% off. Just use the discount code BOICE at checkout. That's B-O-I-C-E. You also get free shipping and a free tote bag while supplies last. Again, that's studio.com. Dot com discount code voice and studio is spelled S U D I O. Here it is without further ado, my conversation with Joseph Casara. And there is a bit of interference that happens in an interview, but it does not take away from a great conversation. Here it is. Enjoy. So I read your book in galley form, which is, means it's uncorrected, mm-hmm. right? It is. What process in the whole publication? arena is that for you do you get to make any changes once it's a galley yes mm-hmm. so there were actually two galleys okay i don't remember which one you read the mm-hmm. first one did not have the face on the cover and that okay. was a really early galley we wanted that available for the librarian conference that i was doing a panel on so we could give early copies mm-hmm. out but there are usually two rounds of copy editing okay. that go on after that. And then there's the proofreading rounds. Mm-hmm. So the copy editing rounds are to kind of catch mistakes. Like one example I can give you of a mistake that I had made was when Angel and Venus are eating cheesecake in Midtown, I have them at Juniors. And mm-hmm. the copy editor wrote a margin note that said, well, the Juniors in Midtown wasn't open that year. Okay, So you could 
you put them at a different place. You can, mm-hmm. This is an option that you go to, or you can have them eat cheesecake at the at the juniors in Brooklyn. And yeah. so that's the type of thing that the copy editors are looking out for. And then the proofreaders look out for missing commas or mm-hmm. um, incorrect punctuation, capitalization, things like that. Yeah. So when you get to the version uh, I saw was with the actual cover on it. Yeah, so I think that must have been after the first round mm-hmm. of copy edits, before the second one. And there were some major things that had changed, I think, timeline issues. Okay. Um, yes. Okay. And then, and that was also before the proofreading mm. took place. So there were, I mean, I definitely know that there were some typos yeah. in that version, and that's kind of normal. Mm-hmm. And I think what's fun for people who collect books is sometimes they like to have their early galleys yeah, because yeah. They, get, they get to see the kind of typos that exist. Uh-huh. Yeah. Is it in galleys when it starts to feel like a real book? to you yes Uh, this is my first book Mm -hmm. and so when i was sent the first galley in the mail i thought oh my god this is what it's going to look like because you get to see it's no longer in manuscript form Mm -hmm. it's not like times new roman double spaced it's like actually in a font and on a page Uh and that is pretty cool yeah yeah Yeah. and uh so did you have i read about the the designer did the cover sarah woods yeah sarah wood did the cover yeah Mm -hmm. And did you have any ideas for her going into it? No, I didn't. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't have any ideas. I wanted to leave it it up completely to the designers. Mm -hmm. I didn't want to impose anything on them. And my editor sent me a a copy of like an image of what they were going to do. And it was a face with a font and then a font that's similar to the font that they actually used. Mm -hmm. And there was no kind of rainbow gradient over it, which yeah. is like is kind of on the cover now. And I said, "Oh, you know, I, the, I was shocked by the face first of all." Yeah. And then um, a day later, I was like, "Oh yeah, I really, I really like this face." Um, but I there was I didn't like the M in the font, okay. for example. And so I was just saying, you know, could you? It's so dark. Could you maybe make it a little lighter, or, or change the face, or mm-hmm. you know, do some kind of editing to make it a little so that it doesn't feel so dark? And so yeah. what they did is they put that nice kind of rainbow gradient over it. It's, the final copy is very shimmery, mm-hmm. which the galley is not shimmery, but the final like cover yeah. is. And then there was an issue with the face. So the face that I saw, the original mm-hmm. one, isn't the actual. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There was an issue because I guess the modeling agency. Mm-hmm sent this email that just said, sorry, we're going to pass yeah. when they asked if we could use their rights, which is, must have been horrifying. And I was, I was left blind of that. I knew, oh, so you didn't know that. They the told time. me that there was an issue. They were like, we're going to reshoot the photo in uh-huh. Paris. Um, and we're going to recreate this. But I didn't realize, I didn't know about that email. Yeah. And I, you know, it's, I think it's wise of the editorial team to keep the author uh-huh. in the dark for that because it, I, it would have caused unnecessary stress, mm-hmm. I think, on my part. <laughs> but um, now, in hindsight, I think it's funny because it almost is like a hashtag of like, hashtag, sorry, we're going to pass. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's like- what, it must have been heartbreaking, too, for Sarah because she had gone through so many drafts of mm-hmm. possible covers and then to be told, like, no, you can't use this yeah. image and like, what? do you do after yeah. that yeah and there were okay when you say sorry we're gonna pass there's no like negotiation there or no yeah you know, it is was, this about money <laughs> this is about you know like you know nothing right exactly yeah. and i think that she may have sent a follow-up email uh-huh. and then received nothing it also i think she had mentioned in the article that it was a 17 minute difference between when she sent Okay. The email asking <laughs> and when they responded so it was like they took 17 minutes to think about this decision yeah. uh, which I, I just think that they must not have understood what mm-hmm. they were being asked yeah. because why would you say no I mean to have your image on a book cover yeah. I assume that they would have been paid for the rights yeah. and like why would you say no and your model you would think that, right yeah that's yeah. what you want yeah. I would think so <laughs> but I, I guess they didn't yeah so you never had any ideas what you like oh you know I wouldn't mind my cover as you were writing the book I what it might really like. didn't well when I first started writing the book I didn't realize I was writing a novel mm-hmm. and, it, and then it was maybe like 50 pages in that I thought oh this isn't just scenes that I'm writing it's not mm-hmm. they're not stories this is actually a novel and I didn't think about how the novel would be packaged. Okay. I didn't get that far. I think because it was my first book, I was just kind of stressed of, of like, is this is this going to be a practice novel? Mm-hmm. Is this actually going to get published? Um, will this subject matter get published? Yeah, yeah. You know, I, the publishing world 
doesn't really pay much attention to stories about people of color and mm-hmm. queer people, people living in poverty, maybe like one or two of those, yeah. but it's rare to find a book that covers all three. And so I was wondering like, would a big house even take this on or mm-hmm. am I going to have to go the indie route okay. or, you know, like, you know, and eventually now, I mean, I know yeah. that a big house did pick it up and it's been getting good press. Um, and I feel really fortunate mm-hmm. for that and really lucky because I don't know, there just aren't, there yeah. aren't many books that kind of, that houses are willing to take a risk on. Mm-hmm. So what kept you encouraged during the writing process? I think my peers in my grad program, because mm-hmm. I wrote this when I was doing my MFA and I spent the two years in the program kind of working on this and submitting chapters mm-hmm. um, to my workshop. And so the feedback that I got from my teachers and kind of being around other writers. Yeah. And I was living in Iowa City, uh, where I, I live right now, but um, Iowa, especially in the winter, is really desolate and cold, and you kind of spend a lot of time indoors Mm -hmm. either by yourself writing or kind of drinking inside with other writers and all we do you know if you've ever been around other writers they only talk about Mm -hmm. fiction right we we only talk about books and so being in that kind of community was just really helpful and then also meeting people who had published books and thinking like oh it's actually possible Mm -hmm. right like I, i never grew up around artists or okay. writers um so i never kind of knew how it was possible to make that kind mm-hmm. of life um until i was in graduate school okay. when other people were kind of living that kind yeah, of yeah. life yeah because you're from new jersey right i grew up in new jersey okay mm-hmm. and siblings i have a younger know? sister okay. mm-hmm. and what was it like growing up in jersey well i grew up in central jersey about an hour from new york and mm-hmm. an hour from philly um, both of my parents grew up in the city, mm-hmm. so my mother's from the Bronx and my father's from Brooklyn. So as a kid, I used to spend a lot of time visiting family on the weekends in the city. Mm-hmm. Um, New Jersey is <laughs> an interesting place, yeah, yeah. to say the least. Uh, it has a national reputation for being a state of irony, uh-huh. I think. Um, <laughs> but I grew up 30 minutes from the shore and in the town where Bruce Springsteen was from. Oh, really? Yeah, okay. we have a shopping mall. I mean, New Jersey's just kind of weird, and yeah. I never realized how weird it was until I left. Mm-hmm. And it is always shocking, what, like, now that I live in the Midwest where people are like really polite mm-hmm. and really nice to come back to New Jersey and then like experience New Jersey drivers again, okay. or then like <laughs> we're seeing people like screaming at each other yeah. at the grocery store. Like, welcome you know, back. <laughs> yeah, I'm just like, oh, that's right. Like, that's right. I'm in New Jersey. Um, when I first arrived in Iowa City and I went to the grocery store, some guy who was like putting like fruit in the in the produce section uh-huh. he, you know he stopped what he was doing he looked at me he was like hi how are you today and he like waited for my response yeah. and i was just like this is <laughs> like why is he talking to me <laughs> like does he oh it was just like he's being friendly he's yeah. actually being friendly whereas like i don't know there's just a different mentality yeah. in new york right like in new york and new jersey you kind of mind your own business you can be on a street full of uh, hundreds of people, um, but it, you know, you could be listening to music and mm-hmm. you're all alone, right? Yeah, Especially yeah. on the subway, yeah. right? Everyone yeah. is kind of all alone on the yeah. subway. People aren't like chatting and being friendly with right. each other. Mm-hmm. And did you, were you writing as a kid, reading a lot? I was. I loved to read. I learned to read early. Mm-hmm. I learned how to read um, in preschool. And I was writing a lot. I had notebooks and I took creative writing classes when I could, if they mm-hmm. were offered in school, like in junior high, they were offered in high school also. And I remember once being really young and I like was like, I'm going to write a novel. I'm going to like yeah. get this like marble composition book and I'm writing a novel. And then I wrote one sentence and I was mm-hmm. like, I'm done. That's my whole novel. Yeah. <laughs> it's the shortest novel I've ever written one sentence. Says it all. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Was there like a book you read that was like made you think it was possible to? Well, the first a book that I read, I remember being in high school. Um, I was an upperclassman, so I must have been a junior or senior in high school. And I read The Heart is a Lonely Hunter by mm-hmm. Carson McCullers, and it was just so beautiful. And it made me want to be a writer. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then, and then when I was in college, I remember reading Joan Didion. Okay. 
I w- it was in my writing class, like my composition class, and we read, I think it was her essay about the Central Park Five, mm-hmm. which is interesting because stylistically that essay is not similar to her other work, Okay, but it introduced me to her work, and her sentences are so beautiful. She's a stylist, um, and that made me realize that I really wanted to be a writer. Mm-hmm. Like I think Carson McCullers told a beautiful story, but Joan Didion made me realize the beauty of the sentence, like what was possible yeah, on a sentence yeah. level. Okay. Because mm-hmm. you went to Columbia, right? I did. I went to Columbia. Mm-hmm. And where'd you go for writing? I went to the writer's workshop in Iowa for mm-hmm. writing. Okay. But would you oh. go for Columbia? Oh, Columbia, I was an English major and a creative writing major. Okay. Yeah. So the goal has been to write a book. Yeah. Well, I went into Columbia not as a writing major. Mm-hmm. I went in as an anthropology major okay. and I kind of thought I was going to go to law school. Yeah. I wanted to do like international law and like peace studies. Mm-hmm. And then I, because I had always taken creative writing electives and I love to read, I took a beginning fiction workshop and I loved it so much. And mm-hmm. the syllabus was all contemporary short stories. And I changed my major <laughs> to creative writing. Yeah. 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 And then, so I was only a creative writing major. And then I just took English classes on the side for fun because creative writing you you study basically contemporary stuff mm-hmm. like what is happening right now the literary conversations taking place what's being published in yeah. magazines but English majors study like the history of the English language yeah. and like medieval lit and Victorian lit and so I found that taking English classes on the side was really fun and enhanced the kind of education, the, mm-hmm. the types of things I was reading. And then by the time I was a senior, I realized, oh, I only need to take four more English classes for this to be a major. Yeah. So I like double majored okay. kind of at the last minute. <laughs> <laughs> was it scary letting go? Okay, your initial goal was to be major in anthropology, yeah. be a lawyer. Mm-hmm. Was it scary to let that go? Was that a pro- it process? It wasn't scary to let it go. I mean, I think now I look back on it and I think I was like really optimistic yeah. and I think my naivete about how the writing industry worked actually helped me because mm-hmm. I didn't like it is it's so difficult to get published, right? And yeah. so I just thought like, well, if I work really hard and I like write a book then Maybe it'll get published, yeah, and then. Yeah. But it wasn't until I was in grad school where it was like, "Oh no, you can write a book, and like maybe it won't get published, right?" Like that is definitely <laughs> Many books. that right? Exactly, that is like definitely a possibility. Yeah. Um, but it it was many years between like when when I was nineteen and I changed my major mm-hmm. to like when I was twenty four, twenty five, okay, and in graduate school, um, I was like I had already been writing for several years. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And with uh, the writing of the book, I mean, uh, wanting to write the book, did you have ideas at any point then what the book might be? Or what did it take seeing Paris is Burning? So I started watching Paris is Burning. I, I saw it for the first time when I was 18. Okay. And Would it be I, high school or freshman I year? I think it was the very beginning of freshman okay. year of college. And I had, I just come back to it every few months mm-hmm. and had come back to it every so often for years. Yeah. And then it wasn't until I started grad school where I thought, Oh, you know, let me just like, let me experiment writing some scenes where I have some of the people from the movie mm-hmm. um, and then fictionalized characters. Like what would that be like? Yeah. And then I had enough scenes where things were starting to take shape. And then I realized it was a novel at that point. Okay, Like I, I didn't initially start the project saying I'm going to write this novel Mm -hmm. inspired by Paris is Burning. I think now, retrospectively, I can look back on it and say, oh, of course this makes sense. Like, this is a movie that really resonated with me when I was Mm -hmm. a young person. Um, and it just stuck with me. It stayed with me. There were things that um, preoccupied my consciousness. Mm-hmm. And of course, it's going to come out into the page because sometimes you sit down when you're writing and the subconscious takes over. Yeah. And so there was something about this documentary that really stayed in my subconscious. Mm-hmm. Do you know what that was? Like why you connected with it? I really, so I'm not sure. I mean, I. I remember being this young queer kid in New Jersey, Mm -hmm. not feeling like I had a community, a little um, angry, just like at the world that like a generation of people, like of Mm -hmm. artists and people before me had had died from this virus. Um, 
And yeah, I mean, when I was in grad school, I was also, I was the only Latino okay. that year in the program. I was trying to figure out where my work fit into some kind of literary mm-hmm. tradition. And I was at the limit one a year. I, you know, <laughs> I, I, there was one poet who was Latino and then me. And I mean, the next year there were some more, but you know, it, I'm not here to criticize Iowa because yeah. I had a great experience there, but, um, traditionally it hasn't been a very mm-hmm. diverse program and that that's changed since, um, Sam has come in. Sam is kind of the new director okay. since I think 2006, but there's, um, there's a lot of diversity in the sense of like, there are some African writers mm-hmm. that are there, um, African Americans also and Asians, but I just happened to be the only, the only Latino, Latino that okay. year. And, you know, my peers actually were really helpful. Mm-hmm. Like, e- like even my white peers yeah. could, and straight peers could read the work on its own terms. But, I, there is something about a sense of community mm-hmm. and it wasn't even just like the workshop per se, but it was the Iowa city in yeah, Iowa. Yeah. And it is a very white state. Mm-hmm. And I was a TA and I, there were also some classes that I had and all, all my students were white. And, yeah, yeah. and I had asked them like, did you read any books by people of color mm-hmm. when you were in high school? They'd be like, no, like you never even read Toni Morrison. Yeah. So then I would have to make sure that I was assigning books on my syllabus for these students to expose them to more diverse texts. Mm-hmm. So I, that, that's the kind of environment that I was working in. Okay. And because of that, I felt like I was in this bubble. Okay. Right. So I was like, okay, I'm going to try and like use this bubble to my benefit to kind of silence out the larger world while I write this novel. Mm-hmm. Did you feel any ha- apprehension being the only Latino writing about a Latino characters N- that, within the, the workshop? Yeah. No, people would get I mean, it. like, um, I never felt any apprehension just because I felt like my peers were such good readers. Mm-hmm. Um, they were open and receptive to many different types of stories and aesthetics. I don't think that anyone made any like offensive comments. Yeah. I mean, like maybe one or two, but then you just brush it off yeah. and you're just like, oh, okay, like that's, you know, it's just mm-hmm. the person that's yeah. saying it. You, you take it with a grain of salt. Yeah. But like the stuff we carry into a situation, mm-hmm. did you have any of that? Like, well, they're not going to get this. They may not understand this because this is in well, peril of their story. It's interesting that you say that because I, I feel like one of the things that I think about in terms of writing with my own writing and also like other writers of color is Mm -hmm. like our preoccupation with the white gaze Mm -hmm. and like, are we writing for a white audience and like, or are we, so I, when I was writing the manuscript, I thought I am writing this primarily for myself as a queer person, as a Latino. And so I'm going to write, I'm going to use all of my sentences, use Mm -hmm. Spanish, use like gay inside jokes as, and I'm going to assume that every reader will just understand it in the way that I understand it. Mm -hmm. And if they don't, then hopefully the book will teach them how to read it. Mm -hmm. And so that telling myself that I think helped with any kind of, apprehension that i may have yeah, had yeah mm-hmm. okay. was that a process for you to get to um, that no i don't think so mm-hmm. i mean i remember when i first started writing and i was because i was reading like new yorker stories yeah. and like contemporary fiction mostly by white writers i was writing fiction about like middle-aged white people <laughs> in upper middle class <laughs> suburbia who were for whatever reason suffering from despair yeah right? yeah it's like oh woe is me and then, because that is the type of stuff that I was reading, yeah, that's the yeah. stuff that was being published, but it's like, hello, you're like a young Latino kid yeah. from New Jersey, why are you writing this? <laughs> You've got your own despair. Right, right. so I mean, maybe, maybe it was a process for me to like realize, no, like stop telling these stories because you think that is what you're supposed to be mm-hmm. writing, and just write like things, just write what you want to write, yeah, yeah. you know? And so... And then I kind of discovered the voice for this book, and it just felt so natural. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So mm-hmm. going back to Paris is Burning for a moment, how did you discover the movie? Someone told you about it? You'd read about it? One of my friends, uh, like a new friend that I had met my freshman year mm-hmm. of college, mentioned it in conversation, or may have like used a line from the movie, because yeah. there's so many great lines mm-hmm. in that movie. And I just didn't know what the reference was. And he was like, wait, you haven't seen Paris is Burning? Like, are you serious? (laughs) And I was like, what is Paris is Burning? I thought it was a movie about like the city of Paris. And I was like, Paris never burned Uh. to the ground, right? (laughs) Um, Like, it's always been there. Um, So we just watched the movie. Mm -hmm. And yeah, it was like a process of him kind of showing me the movie, which I feel like is 
it's so interesting when you ask people the first time that they've seen Paris is burning mm-hmm. because it's almost like a word of mouth thing, right? Yeah. Like usually it's a friend of yours that has like, has told you to go and watch it. Mm-hmm. Or in some cases, like a professor who's assigning it on a syllabus. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And after you, once you decide you're going to do a book, you know, using fictionalizing the characters mm-hmm. of the movie, I, are you scared? Yeah, like, what do you feel like, okay, this movie is so iconic and it means so much to people. Were you intimidated to approach? Well, I felt like the movie meant a lot to me. And so as an artist, I felt like I should have the right Mm -hmm. to pay an homage to this movie and to the people in this movie in the way that I can, like with my own artistic philosophies. And so my my approach is like I will take inspiration from these people and search for like the emotional heart and kind of like the soul or the consciousness Mm -hmm. um, and then try to represent that in scenes. And so the scenes, a lot of the scenes, most of the scenes are all fictionalized um, and using tropes of literary fiction, the tropes of the American family novel and the structure of the American family novel and kind of superimposing what I think the emotional heart is. Mm-hmm. So, for example, like Hector Extravaganza, who is the father of the House of Extravaganza, he was a real person, he's a character in the book, but I didn't have access to much information about mm-hmm. his life because he wasn't he wasn't a famous person. Yeah, yeah. There was no biographies written about him. So I knew the year that he was born. Mm-hmm. I knew the year that he died. I knew that he loved Angie, and they were the mother and the father of the house. They formed mm-hmm. this house, and when people described him, they described him as being a great dancer. Yeah. That he loved to dance. And so for me, the emotional heart was like, okay, and he, he died from AIDS complications, Mm -hmm. um, which doesn't give away too much of the plot. It happens fairly early on in the book. And so I thought, okay, he was robbed of his life really young because he died like the year before the year of that AZT was approved. Mm -hmm. He died really young. That's really sad. Um, he was a great dancer, so in the book he actually wants to become a professional dancer. Mm-hmm. That's his dream. And then I show kind of the the love story between Angie and Hector. Okay. Love stories are classic tropes in yeah, fiction. Yeah. And so in the book he writes letters to Alvin Ailey and Martha Graham, who are famous dancers. I have no idea if he ever wrote mm-hmm. letters to yeah. these people, but by... For me, the emotional heart was like he wanted, I imagined him as wanting to be a dancer. And then by having him write these letters, which are fictionalized, I'm placing him in conversation Mm -hmm. with like iconic queer art Mm -hmm. and a lineage that came before him and creating this like network of emotional connections to try and get towards something that feels emotionally true. Um, like poetic truth. Mm -hmm. And in that sense, that is where the fiction writer is kind of lying to you, right? Like where we're betraying historical accuracy in, um, an effort to get at, um, truth, Mm -hmm. not necessarily facts. Yeah. And Mm -hmm. as a reader, I mean, it made me really feel the pain of his life Mm -hmm. because here he has this dream and what he'd like to do. And yet, you know, Mm-hmm. That that's not going to happen. So it really yeah. gets like to the heart of someone's dreams. Yeah, that is kind it of the goal. Realized. Of, absolutely, yeah. that's the goal of fiction, right? Like we want to make the reader feel genuine emotion mm-hmm. and empathy with the characters to just learn something or feel something about the, what it means to be human. Mm-hmm. And we root it. Um, we want the reader to connect to it, um, but we root it in some kind of specific detail. Yeah. And those details are usually like... I mean, they're fictionalized, mm-hmm. right? It's, yeah. 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 So, uh, what was your process for writing a book? Did you have like a strict outline? Like it changed as I was writing. Mm-hmm. So, when I first started writing, which I mentioned, I was just writing scenes mm-hmm. and I didn't really have a sense of what the shape was going to be. And then as I accrued pages, I realized okay, th- there's a shape coming together i need to understand what that shape is and that's when i kind of looked at the book as having a three-part structure with a coda at the end and then once i had that shape i created an outline a basic outline 
which acted as a roadmap. Mm -hmm. And so the nice thing about outlining, some of my friends don't outline at all. They're kind of horrified that I can pre-plan ideas, Mm -hmm. but I never stick to it in a strict sense. Like it's almost like a roadmap. If I know that I'm going to drive from New York to Washington DC, I can like map out that route. But if I'm on the road and I see a sign that's like, world's largest beach chair Mm -hmm. like in this tourist town you can be like oh let's like take a detour and go to this town like there's other ways that you can get to the end point Mm -hmm. of washington dc but at least i felt comfortable knowing that i if i took detours to like see what certain scenes would be like and they weren't working out Mm -hmm. that there was something that i could go back to okay and that was the structure of this outline okay um which was a framework for me to like imagine how to finish writing a book Mm -hmm. because the process of writing a novel sometimes feels like you are on the beach and you go into the ocean and you just swim straight. And then you eventually for, you can't see the beach that you just left Mm -hmm. and you have to keep swimming forward knowing that eventually you'll hit another beach. Okay. And then as you're swimming forward, you see the land Mm -hmm. and you're just like, okay, that's the end in sight. And I just have to keep going forward to get there. And it feels more comfortable when you have some kind of structure, like an Mm -hmm. outline behind that. So that was the process for me. And once I got to that point, I was writing about a thousand words a day. That was my minimum. If I could get to 2000, I Mm -hmm. felt really accomplished. There were days when I did write 3000 and then I would have a headache. It was like 3000 was my max. As soon as I hit 3000, I would Uh just get a headache. Okay. Um, and I wrote in the mornings so that I could get it done before lunch. And then like I would go to the gym to kind of get back into reality, Mm -hmm. you know, like after spending so much time in my own mind in a tiny office, um, in the English building, which is where I was supposed to be grading yeah. papers, but I kind of hold myself in there because it, there was nothing in the office. It was, mm-hmm. it was in a basement. And so then I would go to the gym and like it would bring me back into my own body and bring me back into reality. And then I would have the rest of the day yeah. to either teach or attend my own classes or um, hang out with friends. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Do you enjoy writing? Did you enjoy the process? Of- some days. Mm-hmm. I mean, some days it feels really pleasurable, and yeah. some days it is just so not pleasurable. Yeah. I mean, it's work. Um, sometimes, if, you know, especially writing sad scenes, it can be really hard. Writing funny scenes mm-hmm. is fun because, like, the humor is never pre planned and kind of takes me by surprise. Mm-hmm. And so then it's really enjoyable. Okay. It is really enjoyable when I'm in the zone and I like it's just, it's flowing. Um, but then there are days when I feel blocked and then it's like really painful because I know that I have to sit down at the desk and kind of wait for it to come. Mm -hmm. Even if it means just sitting there until lunch and staring at the screen, you like (laughs) you have, you have to sit there, right? You have to, if you want to keep the same kind of um, routine, Mm. even on days when you can't write, you have to kind of be at the desk. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Cause I've uh, published a few novels myself. So there's the mm-hmm. whole, you have to go to the work, to the process. You can't wait for inspiration. Yeah. Absolutely. And it, it just means sitting there. Absolutely. Yeah. And then there were days where I felt like you could, like I was tricking my own mind. Mm-hmm. Like once you, at least for me, um, if I knew I was going to sit down at the same desk in the same office in the English building, by the time I would get there two weeks later, nine in the morning, I would sit down and it was almost as if my brain knew like now is the time that you have to start writing mm-hmm. in the same way as like, you know, when you like get into your bed, if you yeah, have, if yeah. you have the same bedtime, mm-hmm. it's like your brain just knows like now is the time yeah, to yeah. go to sleep. <laughs> so like, you know, it's like now is the time to like the subconscious can take over and you mm-hmm. can like start reentering this fiction world that you were in you know, the day before. Yeah. Yeah. I would take the weekends off though. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Like, like a real job. Well, I yeah. felt like, I feel like two days is the perfect amount of time uh-huh. because anytime you get after three days and then it's, you have to rediscover the voice, the rhythms yeah, of the yeah. voice again, or like you may forget like how the plot was going mm-hmm. and yeah. But yeah, I mean a thousand day, a thousand words, five days a week feels like totally doable. And that's mm-hmm. what I usually tell all of my students like people who want to write a novel it's like just write a thousand words a day Mm -hmm. it's like four pages double space it's really totally doable if if you just make the time Mm -hmm. to do it yeah and since the ball scene you can't have a ball scene right without music that's right what is like your connection to the uh, music in the uh, documentary and your own life music you listen to did you 
Yeah, so I right? loved I love the, the music, music in the documentary. Um, I remember being a kid and like in the mid '90s listening to KTU mm-hmm. and like the Latin freestyle and hip hop. I loved it. I did write um, when I was writing scenes that kind of involved music. So like mm-hmm. when Hector's at Paradise Garage or when Juanito is walking at the ball, I would listen to music. And what was fun about that is I would go on YouTube and I might start with like. Love Me Tonight, I think is the name of the song by Rochelle. And then there would be like the list of suggested videos on the Uh side. And then I would just enter this kind of like music wormhole or just like clicking and just like discovering new music and and certain beats. And what was really cool about house music, like extended remixes, Mm -hmm. is that it's the same beat over and over again Mm -hmm. in a way that feels hypnotizing. Which, like, when you're trying to enter, like, a writing zone and you're being hypnotized by this music, it's so great. And so I was, in the prose, I was trying to, like, there were certain sections that I was trying to replicate that. The sound, the rhythms, Mm -hmm. the music. Um, I think of, like, um, a novel by Toni Morrison called Jazz, which takes place in Harlem in the early 20th century. And there are sections in the prose that feel really playful in Mm -hmm. the way that jazz music is playful. And so I took that as inspiration to try and write certain passages in the book that might have the same kind of beats or repetitions um, as as the freestyle yeah, music yeah. that was playing in the clubs that the characters would have been listening to, which I did listen to like when I was really young mm-hmm. and still love to listen to today. But yeah. Yeah. And what is the, what was the pro- publication process like for you? So I, let's see, when I finished grad school, I had like maybe 85% of the book done and my plan was to finish writing it over the summer. And I just like, I didn't know how it was going to end and Mm -hmm. I just stopped writing. And so, um, the pulse, um, nightclub shooting happened in Orlando. And when I learned about that, I, it felt like, um, I felt angry Mm -hmm. in the sense of like, I felt connected to the people from the house of extravaganza that I was writing about because I felt like we were separated in time. Mm -hmm. Whereas I felt connected to the Orlando pulse victims because we were separated by space. Mm -hmm. Right. If if I were in Orlando, I very well could have been at like Latin night at the gay club. Right. Mm -hmm. And so that felt, it felt like this um, psychic and emotional connection and that was a catalyst for me to finish the book so um, I really pushed myself that summer to finish it I sent it to my agent in uh, maybe the end of July or the beginning of August Mm -hmm. they read it and I made some changes and then we went out with the book right after um, Labor Day I guess is when the publishing world kind of comes back Mm -hmm. from vacation so they sent it to 18 editors and then on a Wednesday and then the next day on Thursday we had an email from an editor saying like she had read it overnight and yeah. she wanted to talk to me on the phone so we set up a phone call later that afternoon spoke to her it mm-hmm. was great and then on Friday she had offered um, to acquire the book and so then what happens is the 17 other editors were kind of notified that yeah. there was an offer and this is um, a bidding war right Yes. Well, that's that's the goal at that point is to like get it to a bidding war, but like they have to be notified and Mm -hmm. like, you know, you have to finish the manuscript soon. Otherwise we're going to take this off. Right. And so, and then at that point there are the editors either step aside Mm -hmm. saying like, you know, I might like this book, but I don't love it enough to want to take it on as much as that other editor did. And so basically two weeks after that, we set up a date for the auction and then there, you know, the editors who were interested placed their bids and then, I had options. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, you look at like the money offer, you you look at the editorial ideas that the editor Mm -hmm. presents in the phone call, the kind of just general vibe that you have talking to them on the phone. And um, yeah, and then you just make a choice. And and I went with Megan Lynch at Echo and she was the editor that finished it overnight for me. For me, the the initial enthusiasm was really Mm -hmm. important. The fact that she finished it so quickly yeah. felt so strongly enough to like make a really early offer and then she also kind of had the vision of what the book could potentially be mm-hmm. the, which is the book that readers can hold in their hands now the manuscript was a little different right yeah. the first part of the book was much more messy mm-hmm. and she kind of 
she saw that it wasn't perfect. It wasn't ready to be published, but she kind of knew what questions she could ask of me to help get me to revise it into a better shape. And so that that's kind of what the publication process has been like. Okay. And yeah. you've been getting a great response. Yeah. The pre-publication response has been great. Yeah. And I feel really fortunate. Yeah, yeah. And I, I guess I have to ask that since it is a novel and it's factually, you play around with yes. dates, if that may be the term to use. And there's been some criticism for that. How yeah. are you handling the criticism as a debut author? So I... I do like reading some of the criticism mm-hmm. in certain um, reviews because I think that it can help me grow as I write my next book. Mm-hmm. If, you know, I'm really interested in hearing what um, people say are my strengths, things that stood out to them, and things that like feel like they need to be changed yeah. or you know, negative reactions to the book. Um, if there are any negative reviews about like the way that I play with time or mm-hmm. dates or Um, any of the factual information related to the characters, I think that it's just a a matter of different approaches to um, historical archives. Mm -hmm. And I think that like people who have a very strict um, adherence to history are going to probably have some issues with the way that I take liberties and, you know, poetic license. Um, I would just like to remind them that I'm a fiction writer. I'm Mm -hmm. I'm not as interested in historical facts as I am at getting towards like, the human experience yeah, and yeah. consciousness and truth. And so in this book, I mean, most of the novel is really set in domestic spaces, mm-hmm. quiet conversations that characters have amongst themselves and watching them kind of fully realize their lives, their relationships with each other, yeah. falling in love, kind of grappling with illness, things like that. Um, and the book is kind of set up against this historical yeah, backdrop, yeah, yeah. right? But is not necessarily. Um, it's not going to be like a biography. Mm-hmm. Yeah, novelists, I think, don't. I, I think um, Nicole Krauss is the novelist who said this: "Is the novelists don't owe you accuracy, mm-hmm. right? Like we're not accountants." Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> We just kind of are here to tell you a story. And the thing is, when a reader goes into a book and they know that it's fiction, it's like it looks and it sounds like the real world because we're trying to recreate that Mm -hmm. on the page in a way that makes you suspend disbelief and so that you can enter this fictional landscape. Um, But at the end of the day, it is fiction, right? And characters can like fly in fiction Mm -hmm. or like magical things can happen. And I don't write magical things, but um, what I do do is I I take certain liberties Mm -hmm. um, for the, um, for the sake of the story. Yeah. Great, mm-hmm. great. Well, I think it's a great book. Thank you. Yeah, and I'm happy to see all the things, good things that have been happening Thank so far. Thank you so much. And uh, where's the best place for people to check you out online? Well, I have a website. Mm-hmm. It's um, josephcassara.com. Mm-hmm. And I think that I also have an author profile on the HarperCollins website. Okay. So either of those is fine. But, um, you know, a simple Google search of my name and the title of the book will get results yeah. will eventually get you to my website okay. and mm-hmm. the book is available everywhere mm-hmm. good and yeah. did i forget anything i leave anything out i Joseph? don't think so i think that's that was very comprehensive cool cool well thank great. you for joining us i appreciate it thank you this is great and there you have it my conversation with author joseph Cassara. make sure you pick up his excellent book the house of impossible beauties head on over to his website joseph and Cassara is c-a-s-s-a-r-a a, I'm online a couple of places, talkmusictalk.com for more podcast information and to stream every single episode. You can also find me on Instagram at this is voice. So follow me there. A couple of call to actions for you. If you enjoyed this episode, please share it on social media. You can do something like taking a screenshot of the episode and you can put that up on Instagram. Make sure to tag me. You can leave a five star rating, especially on iTunes, because this all helps to grow the Talk Music Talk audience. Another great thing you could do is download the Talk Music Talk app wherever you like to get your apps. Just search for Talk Music Talk and you can also find the podcast on soundcloud at soundcloud.com forward slash this is voice thank you so much for listening to this episode with joseph Cassara. i hope you enjoyed it until next time and there will be a next time this one's for you liz 